Welcome back to the show, everybody. Wow, the last lecture was amazing. Smooth. Anthony is smooth. Mm. That was nice. Lindsay, appreciate all your help. Um, talking about smooth, we got Dave Tilly and Duesh right over here. Duesh Pudial. Am I pronouncing that name right, du Duesh? Podell. Close. All right. Duesh Podell. And these guys here, this is um, Duesh here, and this is Dave. I'm sure that uh, many people here have heard Dave. They're going to um, talk about elite training for um, men's gymnastics and, and also women's gymnastics for sure. All right. Yeah. So that was definitely a phenomenal way to kind of bridge through what we're going to talk about with Anthony and uh, Dewey and I were texting back, back and forth, like, wow, this can be more perfect as like a perfect setup for like what we're going to go into. Um, and so I think the, you know, just so people who are familiar with Dewey and I, um, I, I'm, I was a gymnast and I kind of have my sports PT work and I work as a strength coach and a, and a researcher also, but I still coach and um, Dewey can fill in his stuff, but we, we were really lucky to work at a champion called a uh, study called champion uh, physical therapy and performance, which is in Waltham, uh, Waltham, just outside of Boston. And, uh, we are surrounded by some of like the really, really smart people in our fields, respectively, Mike and Lenny are pretty much international experts in PT. And then we have an incredible staff of amazing strength coaches, including Dewey. So we kind of have this crazy melting pot of, you know, people, ideas, new research, all this kind of stuff. And, Five years ago when I joined, I was super lucky that what Mike and Lenny had done in the baseball world, uh, they were willing to help mentor me to help getting it into the gymnastics world. So uh, I think that what we've seen and, and kind of Dewey and I were talking is, this is almost like our ideal version of the sport for the future, right? We want what we're gonna talk about today, which is kind of using a hybrid model of strength and conditioning to become gold standard pretty much everywhere. And if, and if I'm being honest, 10 years ago, I don't think uh, that was going to happen. But I think now we are at a place where a lot of college programs, pretty much every men's college program lifts, every women's college program I know lifts, a lot more high school guys, J.O. and stuff are lifting. And we've been fortunate to be able to become kind of tip of the spear with uh, creating some things, you know, that we think are really valuable, along with people like Anthony and other people in our region or around the world who have been kind of scratching this itch for a while. And we, we've had a gymnastics performance program in the summer, especially, but uh, through the year as well for um, you know, high school, middle school, high school, uh, collegiate, and now some more elite guys for the last five years. And so we've been really lucky to see a high volume of athletes in terms of what works, what doesn't work, what we think is valuable and kind of combine all of our ideas. So, um, do you want to give yourself a quick intro and then I'll jump to the beginning? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm currently the, the director of fitness, a champion. Um, you know, I think Dave summarized it really well. I think like I'm super, super fortunate to, to work with what, who I think are some of the best physical therapists in the world um, and some really, really good strength coaches. Um, you know, I've had some good mentors along the way too. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think I'm like a slightly different perspective in that I didn't start with the gymnastics background. Um, I, I have had zero prior experience in gymnastics um, as a sport. Uh, but I think like getting that exposure through Dave and some of the athletes I've gotten to work with over the last four years of champion. It's, uh, you know, it's been really exciting to kind of see the sport grow, but also like see myself grow and expand in the knowledge, um, and how to coach gymnastics athletes and strength conditioning. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been a really cool process for me to just kind of have an outside look at it and, you know, grow along with what, you know, Dave and I are trying to do a champion and, you know, Dave separately with shift movement science and, you know, Dan, obviously, with all the stuff that you're promoting and with Region 6. So, you know, it's uh, it's cool to be involved in all this. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's, it's an exciting time for the sport, for sure, because I think, you know, we're on the brink of what I, again, hope becomes gold standard. But I think we're going to see when we finally get into some new ideas and try some new things, we're going to see a level of performance and also a level of excitement in the sport and, you know, minimizing needless injury uh, I think we're going to see something that's never really before been seen and, and we're going to be really excited in a couple of years so to kind of start off and frame this talk like I said this is kind of like our pitch to the world about like we want this to hopefully become gold standard and the three things that we're trying to really do in this lecture and hopefully through some of the, the examples we show is, is number one is we're all chasing the same goal which is we're trying to maximize gymnastics performance and minimize injury risk right we're all chasing that same goal of we want kids to hit uh, you know big routines at meets we want to have the fun we want to go crazy we want to have kids move through the levels, you know, whether they want to move on to the, the next thing in their life after high school or whatever, that's cool. Or whether they have really, really high level goals of 
college and the Olympics, we want to be able to provide that for them, but also keep them as safe as possible so they can get more out of the sport, right? So that's number one. Number two is we're trying to make sure that we are, I think it's really important to highlight that with this movement of going more into the, the hybrid model or the, using the traditional strength conditioning, we are absolutely not saying that we should throw out gymnastic specific conditioning and that that is not valuable. I think that's a big misunderstanding that people have, especially when they, they listen to me or they, they read my work because they think that we don't do any gymnastic specific conditioning with our athletes and it's completely false. You know, we're trying to say what's the balance here between the general world and the specific world to get the most of the athlete, but also keep them kind of along the spectrum throughout their entire competitive season. So in the summer, it's typically more, you know, uh, loaded into the general stuff, but then it moves back into the gymnastic stuff. And I would say for probably five to six months out of the year with all the athletes that I, I coach myself, I still coach optional women's gymnastics, but the people at champion, I mentor for, you know, whatever else they're doing and all the consulting work I'm lucky to do here and around the world. I'm telling them all like for five to six months, you should be a specific gymnast. You know what I mean? Like you should be doing all gymnastics and peaking for your meet. So I really want to get away from that, that narrative that, you know, we're trying to, to stop quote unquote, the gymnastics experts from doing their thing. That's not at all true. We just want to blend the best of both models, right. To get something that's really exciting. So that's the second thing. And third is, like I said, we've had five years now of experience in the summer. And then also throughout the year, I mean, I work with probably 25 to 30 gymnasts on the medical side per month. I wish it was uh, three to four, but unfortunately the number is a lot higher than it is. So I, I get to see a lot of the, the risk factors and the things that create injury. But then also in the summer, we have a pretty big pool of uh, high school athletes who come. You can see on the right picture, this is from last year's uh, summer performance program with a bunch of men and women. Um, but we have a lot of uh, NCAA college gymnasts that come home and they train with us in the summer. And then more recently, we've started to get a couple of elite guys who are now part of our program. And uh, it's really cool to see because you know they are skeptical at first and so are their coaches, but then when they kind of get their foot in the door and they see what we're doing and it dispels the myths, quote unquote, of strength training, what they think it is, you know, bodybuilding and bro curls. That's not what we're about. They see something really exciting and then they start to get performance gains. And uh, Ian, who is kind of the star of our show in here, he's been with us for a while and Dewey's done an amazing job with this program, but he's put on about eight pounds of like very uh, lean body mass and he feels the best he's ever felt. And uh, he's going to Stanford next year. And then he has really, really big dreams of what comes after Stanford for the national team. So he feels the best he's ever felt and he is fully in love with the process. So it's been really cool to see him get over some of his nagging injuries and feel really awesome. And so that's what we're trying to do is just kind of hopefully share the experiences that we've had. And I think another really good example is Colin Van Wickle. And I've been lucky to work with Colin and, and talk a lot with Colin. And, you know, he was very much in that dogmatic approach that, you know, he didn't think it was going to be helpful at all. And he stayed away from it. But he said that uh, adding a little bit of strength training and kind of that general sense has been the best thing he's ever done. And, and he feels the best he's ever felt in the last, you know, couple of years because doing more of it, but also being more intelligent about his training. And so what we want to do here is kind of build off Anthony's concepts and kind of talk about our two buckets, how we view these things. So one is going to be like the basics, right? Like Anthony was talking a lot about, but these are like your lower level athletes. You think more compulsories. We're doing the same lecture next week for the, uh, the national future stars, kind of like uh, fast track um, side of the world. So we're thinking about what are we going to do for the younger athletes, the athletes that are just getting into like that 10, 11, 12, how are we going to build their base for not only success in the sport, but then also so they can carry this skill set of strength training and general training throughout the next 10, 15, hopefully years. And so it's really important to remember that the strength training age is not your sport age, right? So in uh, one of the newer uh, guys we've had, Jan is a perfect example. He's an amazingly talented, incredible gymnast. He's going to Illinois. He's got an, uh, a scholarship waiting, but he's new, very new to gym, uh, the general side of the fence. And so his strength program is, is relatively basic for what we would consider, but because his training age is so low, he gets a really big impact out of that. So I want you to keep in mind that even though they've been doing gymnastics maybe for a long time, their, their uh, training age for what we're going to show you today is much lower and you have to kind of keep that in consideration. So we'll talk about examples throughout after we get to the geeky stuff is talk about, you know, what are the examples of things that we do like now, quote unquote, with someone who's new or fresh, whether they're 10 years old or 15 years old or, or 20 years old. And then what do we, what do we work towards down the road? And we can show you examples of both in terms of, you know, what Ian's doing and some other stuff, but the skills you see, we compare to obviously are a little higher level because Ian's doing them, but they can make the same application for basic layouts, basic P-bar skills, basic pommel swings. They all kind of travel through. 
Um, and then as we say, we'll move down the road and we'll give you examples as well, of like what the goal is, the, the later, so to speak, right? So these are going to be your higher level athletes. Uh, those athletes that are typically in optionals by the time they're in this advanced phase. And a lot of the NCAA and elite uh, girls and guys who come home in the summer, they've been training with us for three full cycles now, right? We have like a lot of, uh, especially on the women's side, uh, they'll, they're from region six, they get their scholarship, they go to their school and they come home and they have three months to work with and they kind of come back and they get a new program every summer. So they're a little bit more advanced. We can throw some more, you know, complicated exercises at them or some advanced, um, you know, set and rep schemes and things we want of them versus when the younger athletes are in there, they're really just doing the basics. A lot of what Anthony showed is, is exactly what you're going to see in our, in our lectures too, for the, uh, the basic principles to just do those things really, really well. I like how he said savagely well. I felt like that was a very good uh, example of that. But um, this later phase that we'll talk about is going to be building the peak, right? And I think I heard this on a podcast, uh, someone I was doing it with, but you know, the wider the base, the higher the peak. If you don't have a nice solid base then you can't ask these guys to do extreme things down the road same thing with gymnastics right like if your handstand line and your basic pommel swing is pretty crummy then your your you know stutz uh, stutz and all your advanced stuff is going to be pretty pretty hot mess later down the road so taking the time to do these things really well is the same for gymnastics on the strength conditioning side and i feel like those guys do the basics really well they get a big boom out of the initial you know jump but then down the road they're like wow this is really paying off because three years ago four years ago when i started with you guys champion i was just doing the basic stuff really really well so we want to make sure it's a performance bias and then uh dewey's going to kind of talk a little bit more about how we're going to get to what gymnastics needs which is like that power aspect that we're all kind of craving yeah so um you know let's let's first start with kind of you know figuring out how to maximize the athlete's potential right so what, what's our goal in all this that we're, we're going to be talking about today so first thing we got to do is we got to understand what is it that they need right so we know for gymnasts males and females um you know we we know that they need explosive body weight power right their ability to maneuver their body weight and be explosive in that fashion right we also know that they need a high engine for strength uh, because that's what's going to dictate their ability to be powerful, right? So as I kind of have down below, um, is you know, power equals force times velocity, right? So that raw strength, all it is is our, is our top end capacity for force production. Um, and then you add velocity on top of that, and that gets our combination to equal power, right? Which is what we're all kind of chasing with our athletes. So, you know, we start with explosive body weight power, raw strength, and then we also got to make sure that we're not forgetting endurance and capacity. Um, and when we say endurance and capacity, we're not only talking about capacity to handle the stresses of a meet, but also like, how do we get our athletes ready to handle the, the stresses of a practice, right? And we know that these guys are doing grueling two, three, five hour sessions per day, sometimes two days and stuff. So um, we know that we got to get their capacity to be super high to be able to handle all the demands of their practice and their sport, right? So moving on to our next slide here, you know, some of the other things that, um, you know, we're going to break it down with is we kind of talked about the, the power equals force times velocity. Uh, but I also want to make sure we kind of understand like what perspective we're looking at it from. So we got to look at it from perspective of, um, you know, gymnastics specific skill work, but also the general standpoint of strength conditioning and general fitness, right? So from a force standpoint, uh, we know that gymnastics coaches are doing some strength work, right? They're probably doing a bunch of handstand push-up variations, dips, things of that nature. Um, and then they're probably also doing plenty of velocity work with some of their specific, um, you know, technical skills that they have to perform for gymnastics. But we know that there's so much more room for growth, right? So the way that I kind of look at it is, um, you know, I, I like using this bucket analogy. So from a gymnastics athlete standpoint, right, their, their bucket for performance for gymnastic specific skill work is pretty close to full, right? They've, they've kind of maximized that. So what we got to look at is we got to look at force and velocity from a very general perspective as well, right? So they're getting plenty of the specific stuff from the gymnastics coaches, but now we got to figure out how do we maximize their ability to produce force from a general standpoint that doesn't look like a gymnastics movement, right? Same thing with velocity. How do we maximize the potential for velocity from a general standpoint that doesn't look like gymnastics? Right. So now we have this awesome combination of, you know, we're starting to fill the bucket for general performance, you know, and not continue to overfill just a specific gymnastics training. And we get this really good combination of general and specific that keeps an athlete performing better and it keeps them healthier in the long run. Right. Um, and so, again, our goal is to just we're trying to maximize performance, reduce their injury risk. But to do that, we need a combination or a marriage of both gymnastics specific strength conditioning, such as your handstand push ups and all those things that you do in a gymnastics gym, 
but also adding in some, you know, general principles from strength conditioning, similar to what Anthony talked about with some of our hinging, squatting, lunging, uh, rowing and all that stuff. And that's, what's going to equal maximizing performance. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're going to talk about before we get into all like the, the nitty gritty of all the exercises and stuff. Um, I know Dave's going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, workload and capacity and all that stuff. So I'm going to let Dave take care of that here. And then we'll, yeah. we'll kind of come back to the exercises and talk to you guys about that. Yeah. I think the last thing we're really trying to focus on is I think, uh, the myth is that, you know, more training is always a bad thing. And I think that's uh, the research has shook out as it's not really about, you know, doing too much or too little, right? It's, I, th I think when you look at the literature and we can see that definitely spikes in workloads are concerning. And so Tim Gabbett's really famous for this and him and I are working on some literature for gymnastics specifically, but I think it's common sense to know that, right? If you don't do a lot of summer conditioning and you don't really do all your skill work and you just like get to the preseason and you go, oh crap. And you hit the gas pedal super hard and you try to throw a lot of new strength or new plyos or, you know, all sorts of new exercises or routine work at an athlete, they, they probably are going to break down mentally and physically. Right. So that's, that's concerning, but it's important to remember that this research also shows that uh, under training, right. And just leaving yourself kind of out to dry and then hoping things go well is also not good. So we don't want to spike their training load really hard, but we also want to make sure we're working hard enough. Right. And it's actually interesting that research shows that fitness is actually protective, right? So good training, smart training that is hard, intelligently designed and kind of waves up and down with good periodization cycles, which is just planning the intensity of days. It's actually good for the athletes. Right. And so that's where I think gymnastics has a huge amount of performance still left on the table because the strength and conditioning uh, world and our, our, especially the champion, like in our, in our gym is a really great way to fill in more of that building capacity, building strength, building power without the sport specific high force, high rep, high load, which we know, especially in times of puberty can just cause more of a breakdown, right? So it's a fantastic way to fill in the gap here when maybe you're, you're just like Dewey said, just putting that bucket too much on overflow and you can pull back a little bit in the gymnastics high force and add more on the gymnastics strength and conditioning side uh, temporarily. And then once you've kind of feel better, put it back into the gymnastics stuff. And so I think Colin and Ian are really good examples. Again, Colin Van Wicken and Ian, who you'll see in the videos here. Like I think both of them are just such animals in their training, but they felt like they were hitting a plateau in terms of their, um, strength, power, uh, you know, their ability to handle force, their, their training capacity, again, because as Dewey said, they were maximizing only one bucket, which is the gymnastics specific skill work, strength, energy systems, whatever it is. And when they started to add in a little bit of the general work one to two days per week and, and plan it really well to kind of taper away towards their meet season, they felt enormous, enormously better physically and mentally and performance wise. And so I think we have to keep this in mind is that, you, you know, injuries are when the bucket overflows, right? When you put too much into that gymnastics bucket and you break down, you know, from force. So this is a really great way for us to kind of marry these two concepts together and have that performance and injury risk side uh, kind of being something we think about uh, throughout the season, but then also kind of, again, which bucket needs more filling in this, in this time period, you know? And then lastly here, what does this practically mean is number one, it's going to be, you know, when you just throw a bunch of new skills, right? We want to learn new ring strength. We want to learn a new tumbling pass and you just like throw a ton of stuff at the person, right? That's not going to go well. Um, but also not having a plan, not having a slow progressive buildup of the strength conditioning side between gymnastics and general to get them ready for preseason, right? We all know the summer and the preseason is when you should be doing all your grunt work. That's when you should really be hitting it hard or else you're going to get to season and you're going to kind of piddle throughout the year and you're going to fall apart a little bit. So the analogy that uh, Mike Ronald, my boss always teaches me, like it's like sand in the hourglass, right? Like there's two things. You can put more sand in the hourglass or you can control the rate of sand coming through the, the middle. So with strength and conditioning, especially what we do at champion, we're trying to put more sand in the top of the bucket. And then really great coaches, uh, gymnastics coaches are the ones who can plan the season and help express that and make the sand kind of go through it slower. So by the end, hopefully you have a lot more to work with, you know, at states, regionals, nationals, whatever your, you know, your kind of peak uh, should be, so to speak. So what we're going to do for the rest, we kind of got away from the geeky stuff is we're going to try to share the three things that we find uh, are the most important and do we can kind of walk through some of these here, but the rest of this will be all more videos and me clicking through. So don't feel, don't feel overwhelmed. <laughs> Yeah, so our, uh, our, our three main things that we're going to talk about today, um, right, is going to be the importance of lower body power, right? We kind of mentioned the overall requirement or the need for power earlier on, but we're going to kind of break it down by lower body, um, upper body for uh, longevity, and then as well for injury risk reduction, right? So if we hop into our next slide here, um, the way that we're going to set up this presentation is we're going to talk a little bit about 
um, what we do with our younger guys, right? Our basics are used, um, what we're calling our now, uh, what they need, um, some examples of what they're doing. And then we'll kind of do a similar thing for some of our advanced athletes, our, our elites, um, our NCAA guys. Um, so, you know, starting with our, with our youth guys, the things that we're really focusing on is basic bilateral lower body strength, right? So this is kind of what Anthony talked a little bit about, some of our squats and deadlifts um, with two legs, some of our basic unilateral lower body strength, um, unilateral meaning just single leg work. Again, Anthony talked about this a little bit with, uh, you know, split squat variations. Uh, we're also going to add in a little bit more direct uh, muscle work for hip and rotator strengthening. Um, you know, this is the stuff to kind of keep you healthy work on some of the little stabilizing musculature that you know we can't target as specifically with some of our squats and lunges and deadlifts and stuff um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about some of our basic power drills to teach not only force production and power production but also the ability to accept forces right we know that there's a lot of force that's happening especially when it comes to landings and things like that in gymnastics so we're basically starting to give athletes the potential um, the ability to be able to accept these forces as well as produce these forces. So some of the examples that Dave's going to talk about in a little bit is going to be, um, you know, some squatting and deadlifting to build the strength. Um, and then talk about some jumping and landing variations to build that velocity into the spectrum. Um, so Dave, you're, uh, you're up, man. Yeah. So I think the rest of this will all kind of be the way we frame this up is trying to have some video examples of what we're doing with some of the athletes for now and for later, but then also getting videos of gymnastic skills where we're finding these are, they're saying, they're telling us that they feel the most benefit for. So hopefully we can kind of connect the dots between, you know, what we're doing in the gym and why we're doing it and why we're choosing these exercises and what it's going to transfer over to down the road. So uh, this is not Ian, <laughs> this is the only one because <laughs> we didn't have this video, but Jonah here, our Canadian wonder. Uh, so I'll click through them kind of slow to make sure like the still frames go but this is just again what anthony was showing just a basic kettlebell deadlift right just that hinging pattern of driving the hips back and we like to do a version of kettlebell deadlift thing and then also you'll see some squatting variations together again nothing too fancy but just grooving that basic pattern to load and build strength in the posterior chain and then here is again another one that anthony was showing was our split squats right so ian is doing a basic split squat and he's just literally moving through his range of motion right with kettlebells in his side and you'll see later as we work into some like the sprinting and his tumbling and stuff like that why this is so important because we want to develop you know the ability to produce really rapid force to sprint to get velocity for floor and for vault especially but you know split squats are a basic uh, entry point for most of our athletes and between you know deadlifting and split squats and some other variations we'll show um they're just a phenomenal strength builder right uh, a, a kettlebell deadlift uh, a split squat and a goblet squat as anthony was showing are like three basic ways to get a lot of return on your investment for strength and then we have uh, down here on the velocity side, seated dumbbell jumps are another one that we're doing quite a bit. So again, this is more building strength, whereas now we're tapping into the velocity side with the, those newer athletes of teaching them how to use a little bit of overload and, and maximally expressing force as fast as they can. So Ian's sitting on a bench, and he sits with very like you know moderate weight dumbbells in his hands, and he's just working on sitting down and loading and pushing through his heels to get vertical triple extension, right? And again, you'll see how these transfer over, but as most of us know, this is going to show up on floor, on vault, and a lot of our, especially even too on like high bar and stuff like that, when you can explode at your hips for like big release moves. When the athletes learn these when they're younger and they're learning basic taps or basic giants or things of that nature and basic handstand swings for front uprises or whatever else, this is all going to only help that that much more. And again, these little bit of load is just going to help amplify things quite a bit. We also really like doing a lot of single leg hinging variation, more so on our female side, because typically they have a lot of lower back stress, as Anthony said. So we'll start them off with a, a hinged variation of a, of a single leg hip lift. So he has the TRX with some kettlebells around his hips, and you can lift up and you can kind of see that the peak is high. And another thing we do here later, as you'll see, is we'll add some chains, which make, which make the end range of motion very, very hard. And that's kind of where we like that top end explosive force of, you know, tumbling or things of that nature. So just keep those in mind. And what we've done is, is we'll see here, uh, Ian will next do, you know, I think, I think the first one is going to be a, um, one of a uh, double, double. So obviously this is going to be extremely high level, right? Like Ian is, is a much more advanced athlete, but this could be anybody doing a layout or a basic back tuck, right? So as he moves down the floor, just look at the different things that are showing up in terms of what his hips are doing and what his lower body is doing. And it's a little glitchy. I know, and Dan will put on some great post-production, but we'll still frame these and we'll show, but you, we want to see again, what are we aiming for? Like what's the, the goal of having someone do the strength training that we're having them do the different positions of his hips moving through extension and flexion and his ability to, you know, explode vertically off the floor, but then also land and accept the force 
eventually this would be on a hard surface, right? So it'd be much higher for us. But with that in mind, when you look at the still shots of what we're trying to transfer over here, you can see very evidently that these things are showing up, right? So his hip extension and exploding off of the with dumbbell jump is the same exact motion that he needs to tune the floor and extend his hips really well to get vertical force into, again, a back tuck if he's a very young athlete or a new athlete. And in Ian's case, uh, a double-double, a double layout, something of that nature. So, And then again, squatting and hinging together both make up the ability to accept load properly. And you can see that he is going to land in a very similar pattern. Uh, I wish he would look somewhere besides his feet. <laughs> but you can see clearly that that same pattern is showing up so we have force expression and getting off the floor and then we have force acceptance getting down here to the actual floor so hopefully the still shots uh make sense to kind of where these buckets all connect and um we'll talk about now do we can talk about what the the next down the road progression would be yeah so um obviously that was a little bit more of like the basics right so obviously like we had ian do an example of a very high level gymnastics movement but you know we, we did get to see some examples of some more basic strength training that leads into the ability to be able to handle some of those forces and also produce those forces. So now when we look at an athlete that's a little bit more mature, a little bit more advanced, right, we just give them stuff that's more up to their level and what they probably need to be able to produce the forces that they need and accept the forces. So we'll see, um, you know, Dave will show some examples of some advanced bilateral lower body strength movements, right? So basically a progression from our kettlebell deadlift. Uh, we'll see some more advanced unilateral lower body stuff. Um, you know, our progression from that split squat and the single leg hip lift that Dave showed us. Um, then we'll also see some more advanced plyometric and power drills and even some sprinting stuff that we've done with some of our gymnasts to help with vault and floor, like Dave said. Um, so again, um, you know, the examples Dave's going to go over, but works on the continuum of strength and velocity. Yeah, it's important to keep in mind that Ian is a little bit of an outlier here where he is he's so bought in and he loves it so much. And actually his coach trains with us too. So like he's kind of moving through these paces a little bit quicker. Um, usually most of our athletes, this is going to happen over like two full years, right? We're not going to have somebody go from a basic kettlebell deadlift to some ex like heavy, super uh, aggressive trap bar with chains in, the, in like a two month of a program, right? It's not going to happen that way. So think about them in a long term and not just like what we would do the same way that you wouldn't teach somebody how to tap for a Takacha up and then like a week later, be like, all right, man, let's go for it. Let's try this and let's try it laid out. And let's try to do like, you know, all this stuff's crazy together. It's too much. So we're going to build the base, right? Then build the peak over probably like two years. So the progression we have up here is just a rear foot elevated split squat. So elevating the back leg uh, makes them much more terrible and much more challenging. They load quite a bit more because they extend the range of motion um, and they put much more, uh, you know, emphasis on the front leg being very, very uh, strenuous. So it's another great way to add, again, you can manipulate uh, stress on the lower body a lot of different ways. You can add load, you can add the range of motion you can extend, you can slow down the movement and add eccentric or tempo pauses. So it's not always about more reps. And we kind of like these, uh, these types of progressions to kind of think about different ways to get it to carry over better to their, their actual training. And then over here, you have Ian being a savage, right? So trap bar deadlift with chains. So like we said, the chains are on the floor, right, there's less links that are involved, but as he stands up all the way taller, more links come off the floor. So it makes the top range of motion harder. And we really like that, that principle because whether it's with the hinging on a single leg, uh, you know, hip, hip lift or a trap bar deadlift for gymnasts, they're like, you know, all of their money making, so to speak, comes in the top half of the extension of the range of motion. So we try to put the emphasis on really putting the, the end range of motion being the traveling versus, you know, if you are a power lifter, the lift off initially might be more important, but this sport specificity is top range of motion. So we're trying to make that harder at the very uh, top of his peak range. So we have the trap bar deadlift, right, with chains. And then over here, uh, Dewey has uh, Ian on a Woodway treadmill, which is a self-motorized treadmill. And he's essentially just doing some very quick sprinting bursts, but he's working on his mechanics. Ian has been someone who benefited a lot from Dewey going step-by-step, -step, teaching him how to run. Um, Ian, unfortunately, has run for 18 years, and I don't know if any of it's been really technically done well. So that's some of our favorite things to see at our performance you know, program. We have baseball players, everybody from all, and we see the gymnasts who are so incredible in a few things, but then like side to side jumping looks like Bambi on thin ice. So there's a lot of opportunities for improvement here and, and running for Ian was one of them. I hope he listens to this, man. We love you. Uh, but <laughs> just working better running mechanics. And he's he's been very vocal about the fact that consciously thinking about running mechanics and working that uh, along with strength work for vault and for floor has given him a lot more power to work with. And that was one of his biggest complaints. He was like, I don't, I don't know 
I'm running as hard as I can and I'm jumping as hard as I can, but I just can't get enough height to get another half around or to not land on my face, you know, <laughs> when I'm vaulting. So uh, that's for running. And then we have connected horizontal broad jumps here. So again, more than just a single pogo jump, but now he's working on very explosive connected jumps all the way down the turf to kind of think about sync, uh, syncing up some of these things together. And it's much more stressful in terms of velocity and force, right? As we know, connecting jumps than it is one single isolated jump. So those are kind of what he worked in his advanced phase. And then we'll see some of these things again show up in terms of the key points. So uh, we'll show you still soft, but think about like the main things that we just talked about where they're showing up, right? You can see these coming through as he does full and then double front. And granted, he's on a rod strip right now. So take that with a grain of salt, but Still, we, we like this because you can see the key points of performance, right? So front full through to double. And for us, that's kind of what we break it down is, is when Dewey and I look at movements in the gym, what I see in my head and what Dewey's thinking about is really what's going to be the end goals over here, right? So the split squat pattern is more the strength side and the sprinting drills are the velocity side. And that carries over both to him having much more uh, top end sprinting speed to get into some of his forward tumbling, right? And then trap bar deadlift obviously combined with this is obviously backwards i flipped it to make the point but uh the connected broad jumps are, are what he's going to be with landing forces when he's actually landing his second pass and you could also make the argument that a combination of learning how to be stiff with some of those connected jumps and the pogo jumps combined with great technical gymnastics knowledge of how to tune the floor is what gives him a nice you know aggressive punch into his double front and there's no energy leaks right the more tight you are the more stiff you are the more elasticity you have you don't lose that shape right and, and let energy flow out which would be maybe a one and a half to his back and not a full double front so those are kind of on the lower body side and then we'll move now to come of our upper body uh movements do it yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah so for um you know for the upper body it's not that much more different than the lower body right so same concepts for the requirement for power still applies here right now the only difference is we got to look at the different joints involved um in the in the places that are required for power as well as for stability right so we know that the shoulder especially for men's is super super important and more specifically the the ability to have really good opening and closing power um, is super important right and we so we we, we, we look at it from perspective of uh, bent arm and straight arm strength. Uh, you know, we look at, um, you know, body weight stuff that's a little bit more specific. And we also look at just general ability to, again, produce force or produce velocity um, to work on these opening and closing powers in men's gymnastics. Yeah. Um, and I'll jump in here too, Dewey, because I think it's important to note that traditionally what you see in gymnastics is bent arm strength and then straight arm power, right? Like something uh -huh. about to catch up on high bar, think about parallel bars and we'll show some stuff, but you have to realize that the base of being able to express that really aggressive, like think about a peach basket or tapping for high bar, that only comes when you have a foundation of strength. So it, it's, I think a lot of male gymnasts train handstand pushups and pushups, but they forget about a lot of other options that are available to them in the general strength conditioning world to just build general capacity of their shoulder, which is where, again, I think a lot of these guys fall apart is because they're only doing body weight strength. So just my two cents there on the gymnastics uh -huh. side. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and so again, similar format, um, as what we did for the lower body, you know, for the, for the basics, the youth, what we're calling the now, uh, the people with the lower training age, we're working on some basic vertical pushing and pulling, uh, we're working on some basic horizontal pushing and pulling, um, right. Obviously when you say the vertical and the horizontal, we're talking about planes of motion. Um, you know, we're also pres prescribing them some basic, um, cuff, meaning rotator cuff and scapular strength work as accessory to build on some of the missing pieces that we might not get from our, you know, heavy pushes and pulls. Um, we're working on some straight arm um, opening and closing for shoulder power. Um, and Dave's obviously going to talk about some of our examples here, but, you know, we're going to show you guys a little bit of um, some half kneeling angled presses, maintaining a really good hollow body position. Uh, we'll show some true overhead stuff. Um, you know, we'll even show Ian doing some freaky handstand push up stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we also like to use medicine ball slams um, in our gym to work on some um, some closing power here, as you guys will see. Yep. So again, a couple like basic ones we started off in with were you know half kneeling landmine presses. So this is mounted uh, in the corner of our gym, and essentially the bar allows you to press in an angled version. And we like this because oftentimes guys. Uh, sometimes have some issues with shoulder flexibility and doing a landmine press is a really good way to maybe not get that last 10% of range of motion when they first start and I kind of stay away from a cranky shoulder, but we have the basic kind of, you can load this more version, but then also as they get more flexible, we can transfer this over to just a regular half kneeling dumbbell press. 
to work on some single arm work. And again, the split pelvis position is really good to working side to side balance of the hips uh, alongside the pressing motion. So we have just kind of basic strength stuff. And again, it's about a combination of he was still doing all his regular strength stuff in the gym, trying to complement it. And we just put it on opposing days. So we didn't blow his shoulders up too much, but the combination of the strength as base here, and you could also argue dips and pull-ups and everything else that you would do kind of allows you to then have the expre expression of force in a faster way. So standing just med ball slams are a great way to work that shoulder open close and just put, like we say, like, do we want you to, if you break this ball, like you can take it home, right? Like we want you to put a hole in the floor. That's how hard we want to throw versus you can't, ex you can't really go maximal force and speed when you're working on a half kneeling dumbbell press because it's heavier, right? So we take away the load. This is a six pound med ball, maybe do we or an eight. And I think uh, it's an eight. Yeah. yeah. So eight pounds, which he's clearly able to move pretty well, but just in part of his power work is working on that explosive opening and closing of his shoulders to try to get it to transfer over. And then you can see here in terms of, again, another skill that he told us that he was feeling a lot of progress on was just his like basic peach back, uh, peach work, right? So his ability to drop through the bottom, that's technical skill, but then the faster he can open his shoulders, the higher he can get lift, right? So he does a peach to one here, but his, his shoulder opening and closing, more so opening here is where he gets all his pop. And half of this is definitely just knowing how to kind of wait and be patient and tuning the bar. But he was telling us that the more strength work he did and the more he was able to transfer that to power, he felt much lighter on the bars. He felt like he had much more pop off the bars. And he's starting to feel like really, really like floaty, just trying to, you know, maybe peach half or stuff down the road. So you can see the elements of those. And again, just this, the still shot breakdown here is you can see how these pressing variations above and below, plus maybe velocity work and also plus some of his handstand work form the base of why he can explode so much harder here and why he can hold with well supports one or two. And I think this is a textbook example of when there's only so many body weight uh, exercises you can do before you hit a ceiling effect on how you can get stronger, right? Like handstand pushups, you can put a weight vest on for maybe 10, 15 pounds. You could do weighted dips. You could do all sorts of stuff. But until you put like actual load in your hands, from a physiological point of view, we know you're not accessing your full spectrum of muscle fibers, right? Overload with strength and speed helps gain more of that. So I think we're, it's all about, again, getting what we can out of gymnastics side and being technically right with his good positioning, but then adding some extra into his bucket by adding more strength to his shoulder generally, then saying, okay, now go back and be a gymnast and actually apply this over. And I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that the later now. Yep. Yeah, so um, I, I do want to build, before I go into the later, a little bit of what Dave said about the overload, right? I think one of the biggest misconceptions um, is a lot of people try to make do with um, with the body weight stuff, like lower load stuff. And again, Dave kind of said this at the beginning, right? I almost think like this presentation should be somewhat of like a pitch to say, all right, like let's get gymnastics or the world of gymnastics involved in strength conditioning, just like all the other sports are, right? There's a reason that football players – basketball players are doing strength conditioning are heavy into it because they see the benefits of it. They see the benefits of overload um, with external loading. And again, there's only so much you can do with body weight or maybe like adding in like a lightweight vest. Um, but if we, if we can get guys access to a good gym with good programming, with good overloading uh, tools and principles, they're going to be that much better. Right. And I think that does lead into this, this advanced section for the upper body as you guys will see Ian doing some of like very advanced vertical pushing and pulling. You'll see him doing very advanced horizontal pushing and pulling. Um, and you'll definitely see some explosive power stuff, apply metric work um, that is going to have such great carryover and transfer. So for examples, uh, for our strength work, you'll see what we call a Z press, which is a seated position in like a seated half hollow body position, um, you know, in an alternating pressing fashion, you'll see a push press where power is initiated through the lower body. Uh, you'll see some dumbbell snatch where again, lower body initiates the power and the force, um, and then an explosive upper body movement to catch and stabilize. Um, and then you'll see the same thing on like a landmine. And then you'll see him doing some pretty freaky power pull-ups, um, <laughs> where he actually told me that, uh, he just one day at the gym attempted to just pull really high and he just pulled all the way up, up to a support, like a, like a body weight, just strict muscle up like it was nothing. So we know that it's carrying it over for him. <laughs> Um, yeah, so here's a Z press, right? So he's sitting in a straddle and he's doing alternating dumbbell pressing, right? And again, this is much more challenge on his core and it's much more demanding in a sitting position than being able to kind of use the landmine as kind of leaning into it and pressing with your whole body. So much more isolated work. This is the power pull up that Dewey was talking about. So uh, Christy, one of our other strength coaches puts a dumbbell at the top of the motion. He rides the eccentric lower down, which kind of primes the movement, drops the dumbbell from his feet and then does a max effort pull. 
And so what that does is it kind of helps him fire up some of the lats and some of the underarm pulling muscles so that he gets more explosive resistance uh, on the way down for the eccentric part and loads the top. So these are really good, uh, you know, contrast training type methods that we find very, very valuable for some of our advanced athletes. And then we have here a dumbbell snatch. So a single arm dumbbell hang snatch. So just from the hang position, the hinge, and then snatching up and getting under the weight. So we have the explosive kind of jump from the hips, but then also the explosive pull of the arms and then catching a very, very uh, heavy weight under load. And again, the reason we like push pressing and some of these dumbbell snatches, which I think some people get scared of sometimes, are because you can, you can accept more load than you can press, right? With a push press, when you use your legs or a dumbbell snatch, you can have more weight coming down on you than you can pressing by yourself. And so that reactive overhead stiffness is super, super important for guys catching stutzes or tumbling or anything there else they're doing on the top of their hands. It's so important they have that shoulder stability and strength to, to learn how to load that. So this took Ian and Dewey a long time to teach him the progressions, but now that he's safe to do them, he has a lot more exposure to these forces before he ever does high volume skills. And again, it's, it's a little bit more of a prep period where we can help him get ready for those forces along with like Turkish get-ups and, and the arm bars, like Anthony was saying, we can use a lot of these variations to prep some of this very, very high level shoulder demand that you know you hope is coming for a lot of these guys down the road. And then as Dewey said, we have a push press here. So two dumbbells in the front rack, as Anthony was talking about, he dips into a quarter squat, drives up fully, and then he rides a slow three second eccentric on the way down just to kind of get more time under tension as we call it. So push pressing is a great, fantastic way to develop the anterior deltoids and some of the, the cuff to work together to get some, you know, what will be P-bar throws or what will be higher level uh, tumbling on floor for, for blocking especially guys who are doing a front entry vault. This is something we find very, very helpful is, you know, getting the front heel drive for like a hand double front down the road if they do it or something of that nature. And then a landmine push press or sorry, a split jerk. So he's in the front position. He dips similar to how he would in a push press. And then he presses overhead and catches in an angled movement. Again, just kind of two different versions to get a very similar training effect, but someone who maybe has some, some struggle with shoulder flexibility, this might be a better option uh, for them to kind of start with. So we'll see it here again in two, things, then we'll do some skill shots. Um, so obviously this is going to make the most sense for the single arm versions, right? If he does a Dion, so his ability to ride the bottom swing, right? The first thing I want to point out is the ability to handle this force at the bottom right here. You can start to see how that angle correlates to a push press and to all some of the stuff. I can't tell you how many times I swung through and buckled on my, uh, my down swings of parallel bars because I was not strong enough to do some of this stuff. So half of it was me being a wimp, uh, but the other half of it was me just not being strong enough. And, I, and if I had a little bit more, I think, mixed training, I maybe would have had some, some less scary dismounts. But the ability to handle this bottom swing force, obviously a lot of this is technical as well. Ian's ability to ride the swing really well and be patient. But between Turkish get-ups and arm bars and single arm pressing, you can see how that single arm stability and strength is expressed when he does his full DM. And uh, weirdly enough, Ian said that his DMs were gotten so much better and Stutz has got really better, but this is a pretty nice DM. So I, I really would like to see what they look like now. But so we have a DM there and then a front one and a quarter is the next one. So again, think about his ability to handle this position right here in the, in the back as he swings forward from his front uprise. So from here, the strength in this planche position and also the ability to get off the rails right you can see how his arms are in a very similar position as what he finishes a push press on or some of his other split jerk movements so his ability to do a really nice one and a quarter and get vertical press again a lot of this is technical just him practicing and stuff like that but he has told us that his drive power and a lot of his ability to feel more comfortable really going full tilt so to speak on his swings uh, come from some of the extra shoulder work that we've been doing and then i kind of already alluded to it but on the still shot stuff you can see how the single arm versions for Dioms for Stutzes, right? Some of the advanced guys doing Heelys and McCut, stuff like that. It's all the same bucket, but also single arm work on high bar. Um, you can see how these transfer over pretty well. And then obviously the push press, as I already alluded to, is the front swing on the way down. Uh, and then also the takeoff for some, some more release skills. And a lot of these stuff would transfer over. I think one thing we haven't talked a lot about because we didn't have a video is pull-ups, right? And pull-ups and some of our med ball work carries over really, really well to you know, Moyes and uh, Tkachev taps and Kovacs taps and things of that nature in the bottom of ring strength and things of that nature. So there's also a lot more to be said on the other events that we've, we've kind of been focusing on a few because these are the videos that, that he sent us, but there's a lot more to be gained here. Um, so I'll take, I'll take the lead on this one because obviously in the medical side, I see a lot of this. So the third thing we really think is important is there's just so many guys that would, I think, have amazing long-term careers and success if they could just, you know, stay healthy. I think Ian is a perfect example. Ian came to us pre- summer when we were getting back after the coronavirus break and saying he was like yeah you know along with not feeling like i can hit the floor hard enough or stuff he's like my i've had knee surgeries and my wrists always hurt my shoulders always hurt he's kind of just like 
warrior barbarian his way through his, his last few years because he's always kind of been kind of reeled with injuries and so a lot of these things just come down to force overload right it's workload training but also it's just force overload he's trying to do skills that are so high force that if he's not you know technically sound strong enough or you know getting the right periodization in, he's going to break down and so i think that you see in gymnastics it's the workload spikes we talked about they just can't handle the impact force over and over or also, like we said, they don't have that balance between the general side of the fence and the gymnastics specific side of the fence. So they only live in the gymnastics world. And keep in mind, this is coming from someone who learned and, and coached and did everything the traditional way of only body weight and only you know gymnastics specific. And I've had long conversations with Colin, with John Horton, with Dave Durani, a lot of these guys who swore by only body weight and saying not only was weightlifting dangerous, it was, it was bad for gymnasts to do it. They never believed in it. And all of those guys have come around and, and really support what we're doing to try to get a little bit more of a mixed bucket so we can keep them healthier and safer so they would say if they could go back and go do it again they would you know they would be involved in it and tom meadows have i had some long talks about the stuff he's using a little bit to kind of mix in here and there and he's finding good success with it as well so i think we're seeing the sport thankfully moving in a different direction for the younger athletes the one i think pops out the most for uh you know when strength conditioning can become helpful is during uh, rapid periods of growth. Uh, i call it the growth talent crossroads right they're they're really growing at a fast rate but they're often like on the you know, lower levels jumping up in higher levels. So they're doing higher force skills. They're doing more repetitions to learn those skills. They're in the gym more and uh, they might lose some flexibility with puberty. And so there's only so much we can do with those athletes before we get to the dicey territory territory of risk being sore on pommels or, you know, Osgood slaughters and, and knee issues and stuff like that. So we can kind of sometimes continue to progress in the, the physical preparation bucket and also do technical drills and stuff, but make sure they're not, you know, overloading themselves with just gymnastics, but you're building the potential for them to go above and beyond when they do get through puberty fully. And this is a really great quote. Uh, Mike Boyle is a pretty well-known strength coach and we're lucky to have him uh, around this area, but the best injury prevention program is a good strength conditioning program. And I think we know that from the gymnastics world, the guys that are doing the work for strength conditioning, they're fitter, they're, they're willing to put in that grind in time. Um, I think that those are the ones that tend to perform better, but also they, they break down less. And the same can be said for the general strength conditioning side, right? Like on the medical side, a little dose of strength conditioning generally goes a long way for these athletes to keep them safe. And I think we're seeing that come out more and more alongside the performance stuff, which is really, really exciting. And, and a sport that I grew up in, which was just like, put your head down and, and just get through it. You know what I mean? Like, don't complain, don't whine about it, just keep going. And I unfortunately treat guys who have shoulder surgeries when they're like 14, 15 years old or have really bad back and shin issues because they just hit the gas pedal too hard. And I think if we got them introduced to some of these basic strength conditioning programs younger and still had great technical coaching as we do, we'd see a pretty different uh, research paper come out in the statistics of injuries. So the, the things that we can do here, and I try to combine these still shots to kind of drive home these points is strength conditioning can help to do above body weight uh, strengthening, right? So when somebody is, is learning some of their advanced skills, they can start to overload their shoulder progressively, right? Like a half kneeling dumbbell press is one fifth of a DM, right? If you think about just flipping it on its head or a Turkish getup. So you can slowly dose that person over a couple of years and get them ready while you're developing the technical drills and you're spotting them before you kind of let the floodgates open and say, okay, try a Takacha or try a DM or things of that nature. So uh, it allows allows you to add some more extra joint care and specific flexibility stuff in because as coaches, we all know there's not enough hours in the gym at all to get it all in, right? We're constantly battling time and school and other stuff going on. So if we can get them out of the gym uh, and go into the strength room, we can kind of add in some of that extra cuff care, that extra low back care, that extra flexibility work that maybe we don't have time to do in the gym. And we can spend more of our time on the fun stuff, which is what everyone on this call is good at, which is, you know, the gymnastic specific training stuff and the gymnastic specific strength work. Okay. Uh, also trying to make sure that we're patient through those growth phases. Like we said, right. If, if we have someone in that rapid growth where they just hit a, a limit of how many, you know, tumbling passes they can do or how many series of rings uh, strength drills they can do before their shoulders hurt or their knees hurt, we can, we can fill in the gaps here. So gymnastics can kind of pull back a little bit and work on skills and basics and drills, which is what we often do with young athletes going through puberty, but also generally uh, the strength conditioning room can become a place where they can still work on their strength. They can get their capacity up. They can build that power in a, in a non high risk, high force, you know, um, situation, especially as we know, some of the impact forces have been measured at like 15 times body weight. And I think the highest ankle joint recorded on just a double back on floor is 23 times body weight. So if you have cartilage that is not really ready to handle that or a growth plate, you know, you're going to break down before you can actually learn that skill. And we can kind of back off on both sides and, and get more capacity, get them fit without having them have any overuse injuries kind of pop up. So impact capacity and tolerance, as I just kind of said, is the biggest thing, right? Like I think one thing we've seen a lot, and again, we're really lucky at champion where 
I, I treat athletes year round. So not only when they're hurt, but also just for performance stuff. So I, I see a lot of level tens who come in maintenance care during the year, every other week. Um, but we also are consultants for their strength and conditioning in terms of like what they're getting ready to go back to for school. So a lot of our NCAA athletes, what we were finding is they were coming home after a really hard grueling season. We would do no impact with them at all because we wanted to keep them safe. But then they would go back to school and go a ton of impact, right? They would start tumbling on floor. They would get shin sprints. They would get fractures. They would get, uh, you know, overuse injuries. And so what we started doing is using again that middle of the road whereas gymnastics is here and we, nothing is here we, we slowly dose them with plyos over the end of the summer over six weeks and rebuild their tolerance to the preseason that's coming and a lot of our women especially like for um some of the higher level division schools and some of the guys in the elite world, they had a much smoother on ramp to their preseason where they didn't have all of the nagging injuries from impact and they felt much better. But again, we planned in six weeks of progressively higher plyos, which we didn't talk a lot about in this, so that kind of comes down the road, but we're, we're another place where we can add in more plyos that way versus just in the gym doing tons of jumps and tons of sprints and tons of panel mats. There's a much more systematic way to go about that. So we can kind of add in some of that and then we can continue to be that extra bucket of adding force so that they can express that force in the gymnastic specific way as they get back to the actual season. So Dewey's going to kind of take over here and talk about, you know, I, I feel a lot of people are probably spinning a little bit. They're like, oh my God, this is a lot of information, but we want to kind of offer just like what we suggest is maybe the big rocks to take away. Yeah. So like Dave said, we obviously covered, you know, quite a bit today, right? A lot of, a lot of information thrown at you guys, uh, but we want to kind of leave you guys with some big rocks or like where to start. Right. So, First thing is we got to first, as gymnastics coaches or people that are looking after these gymnasts, we got to evaluate what we're doing from a fitness standpoint, not only from um, you know strength conditioning standpoint, but also gymnastics specific work, right? So we're always looking at a full evaluation or an assessment saying, all right, how many days per week are they, are they doing their gymnastics stuff, right? What kind of exercise are they doing, right? Um, are we planning uh, throughout the year, you know, how much stress that they're getting in certain uh, positions or certain movements, are we periodizing certain times where we're pushing, you know, one thing versus another, um, you know, are we splitting up their training so that they're, you know, focused more on um, one type of skill work versus another, right? And similarly, for, you know, general fitness and strength conditioning, we do the same thing, right? We, we figure out how many days per week we have available with them where we can actually push a little bit, right? And that also depends on the time of the season. If, you know, they're full in season, we might only do once a week training with them. If they're in the off season, let's say summertime, you know, we might do two, three, um, you know, up to four times a week of training with them. Um, but we also look at, um, you know, what's important from a strength conditioning standpoint, similar to what we talked about before from, you know, horizontal pushing or vertical pulling or, you know, opening and closing power. We say, all right, what does this particular athlete need a little bit more of for them to achieve their goals? Right. And this is where kind of individual or like customized programming comes into play as we want to make sure that we're not just looking at gymnastics from like an overall general perspective. We're saying, all right, what, what's the athlete that I have in front of me? Right. Are they a male or female? Right. What do they, what does this male need a little bit more of versus what does a female gymnast need a little bit more of? So we're trying to do our best to customize and individualize our programming. So that's always where we start, right. We evaluate and we assess. And then from there, um, you know, we start with just filling the gaps. Like we've been talking about this entire presentation, right? What are we missing from a standpoint of filling the buckets for performance, right? We know that gymnastics, we get a lot of body weight strength, body weight power stuff, and the very technical skill stuff. So we just fill in the gaps that are missing, which is going to be the top end force production. Um, you know, the high velocity things that don't look like a gymnastics movement that has less forces, but we got to build capacity for those, um, those movements. Um, and then we also look at just cardio or what we call energy systems training, right? Whenever we throw out the term cardio, everyone kind of thinks about like, you know, going on a bike and killing themselves or, you know, like getting on a treadmill running for miles, but like, we know that that's not specific enough for a gymnast, right? So this here, we have an example of what I gave Ian, um, you know, earlier on when he started training with us where he wasn't doing that much gymnastics conditioning work is I gave him something that was way more specific uh, for upper body endurance, which is what he needs way more of compared to, you know, anything else. So my example here, he's doing a circuit of three things. He's got a 20 second on 20 second off, um, circuit. So he starts his first movement with a walking lunge where he's holding a heavy sandbag over his head, right? So he's got all of his, uh, shoulder stabilizers firing here, you know, shoulders, not doing a ton of work, but it's using, um, you know, we're using a lot of rotator cuff strength to hold that weight up overhead. He does that for 20 seconds, rest for 20 seconds, and then he's going to move right into a 
uh, reverse bear crawl where his shoulder is stabilizing, but also pushing a little bit. You know, the core is in a good stable position. Um, he's doing that for 20 seconds, resting for 20 seconds. And then finally, he'll finish up the circuit with uh, a very powerful and aggressive, what we call plyo pushup, where he's basically going down to the bottom of a pushup, exploding off that bottom position and literally throwing his body off the ground, right? And he's doing only four reps, so he can have really high quality and high force um, and high intent. And then he's going to rest the remainder for whatever he has left of those 20 seconds for his work period and the remaining 20 seconds, right? And he's going to repeat that for four to five sets. Right. So again, that's, that's just kind of how we plan conditioning work and we try to make it as specific as possible for that particular athlete um, and the demand of the sport. So again, it's not as simple as, you know, all right, we got to get conditioning up. We don't just simply throw them on the treadmill and say, all right, go run three miles. Um, you know, that, that does okay at building just general capacity, but we know that it's not going to carry over as well to him doing, you know, bars and rings and all that stuff. So we find this stuff to be way, way more valuable. Right. So that's what we kind of talk about from, a conditioning standpoint. Um, and then finally, um, you know, the, the other big thing is again, I kind of touched on this briefly earlier, but you know, where can we find time and resources to kind of sneak in some of this general stuff, right? Cause it, it is unrealistic to, to push our gymnasts all year round with heavy training, you know, two, three times a week, all year round. Uh, but what we do is we look at their schedule, depending on, you know, what level they're at. And we say, all right, um, you know, this time of the year, let's say summer, for example, um, you know, they do have a little bit more flexibility in their schedule with school being off um, and also, you know, it being the off season. So we say, all right, this is a really good time to build a good base of strength, uh, you know, build a little bit of muscle. Um, and then we kind of transition over into the preseason where they need a little bit more ability to produce power and high velocity stuff. And we just transition still twice a week, but, you know, instead of like focusing on just trying to make them a bodybuilder and putting on a ton of mass, we transitioned a little bit more velocity work, a little bit more power production work. Um, and then we kind of taper back down again when they're in season and we just work on maintenance, um, you know, and we peak them for, for certain movements that they might need a little bit of work on, um, where we try to keep stress low, uh, but we try to keep intensity high. We try to keep volume low intensity high. Right. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of our like general overview. Um, now, as far as where to start, Right. I think, again, that talk earlier with Anthony was just such a good lead in. Um, and, you know, having people like Anthony and myself is definitely obviously helpful, right? Having a strength coach on hand to help with programming, periodize, uh, periodizing, and also coaching is obviously a huge luxury. Um, but, you know, if you don't have that, right, like having gymnastics coaches become competent teachers and coaches to be able to teach some simple stuff like, lower body squatting, like a goblet squat, like Anthony showed, um, right. Some lower body hinging with like a kettlebell deadlift or, you know, a single leg hip lift, which Dave showed a video of earlier, um, you know, doing some single leg work in a split pelvis position, like split squats or rear foot elevated split squats. Um, you know, I think these are super important. Um, even if you don't have access to a strength coach, like being competent enough to teach this to some of your younger athletes, it's probably going to pan out big time. So that's, um, you know, that's kind of what we think is important for um, where to go from there. Um, and then as far as starting points, which we mentioned earlier, um, you know, again, just finding out which planes of motion, um, which specific movements we need, and just give them a good dosage of that stuff, right? So we've kind of talked about horizontal pushing and pulling uh, throughout the entire presentation. So for someone basic, um, you know, you might start with like a single arm bench press that's horizontal pushing. Um, you know, we might start with some sort of chest supported row where they're, where they're facing down into a bench and they're just pulling up and squeezing their shoulder blades together. Um, right. Easy enough to teach nothing super, super complicated. You don't need a exercise science degree to teach that. Um, and then uh, similarly for pushing, right. Like that landmine press we showed in a half kneeling position, just having access to some barbell that they can uh, push up overhead. Um, you know, programming some band pull downs or even some tempo pull ups with, you know, slow lowers and things of that nature, um, you know, we find to be super, super valuable. So as a starting point for most gymnastics coaches or, you know, someone who does have access to a gym space or equipment, you know, these are all just really good starting points. So um, again, this is kind of the, the overall summary of our presentation, right? Hopefully you guys got a ton of value out of this. Um, Hope we were able to give you guys a little bit of insight into what we're doing 
at Champion, but also, um, you know, what we've found to have been successful over the course of the last four or five years since Dave and I have been working together. Um, so, yeah, if you guys have any questions for Dave and I right now, feel right. free to, you know. Let me go to uh, the group who's on, see if anybody uh, has any comments or anything. But I do have two questions, one for each of you guys. Sure. Um, Craig, Matt, anybody have anything? Jared? Okay, you guys are good. All right. So uh, maybe, uh, Dave, I've worked with you in the past and um, uh, use foam rolling and really believe that foam rolling is like the new flexibility. Um, mm. I, I kind of, there's a difference between stretching something with tension and stretching something with pressure. And they both mm. change the length of the object. Um, but I believe that pressure is uh, a better way to achieve the flexibility. I do a lot of deep tissue stuff. Um, can you talk, I mean, there's two things that, that are key here. Number one is tissue um, wellness. And, you know, the stronger you get, the stiffer you get. And the stiffer you get, the more potential for injury there might be, you know. So um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you deal with foam rolling? How much should they be doing? What, what? And then, Dewesh, um, how about um, the other flip side is that if they don't have nutrition, None of this works. It's all, it's all a big chemistry experiment. And if you're trying to make cookies and you don't have one of the variables, right, or like you put the oven on 275 and it's supposed to be 350, it's not going to work. So one of the variables is nutrition. And, I, and like in my estimates, and this is just from a naive perspective, in my estimates, like Yusuf, the guy I work with, he's going 3,500, 4,000 calories a day. Am I going crazy? Is that a reasonable estimate? So maybe we can start with Duesh and then we'll go to Dave. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So I think for, for nutrition, like you said, Dan, I think, you know, obviously a huge piece of the puzzle. Uh, we know that it's not just gymnastics training and strength conditioning training. That's going to make a difference, right? The, the nutrition, the hydration, the sleep, the recovery, like all that stuff is going to be super important. Uh, but, to, you know, key in on nutrition a little bit. You know, it, it, it's tough to say from like a number standpoint, um, is 3,500 or 4,000 calories um, a good number, right? And that really kind of depends. Um, so what we have is we actually have equations that you can plug in depending on how big you are, right? Height-wise, uh, weight-wise, um, how, um, how old you are, and how much activity you do to burn, you know, X amount of calories uh, with the level of activity that you're doing. That's going to kind of dictate the number of calories that you need, right? So that obviously becomes a little bit more of a math math equation but here's typically where i start with a lot of my athletes in general um, this also applies to gymnasts um, i start with what's what's the goal right is the goal to put on muscle mass is it to maintain muscle mass is it to lose weight for whatever reason right so i always start with the with the why right what are we trying to achieve with our nutrition and then from there i come up with a game plan that says all right we're trying to build muscle Maybe we do need to have periods of time where we push calories a little bit, you know, prioritizing really good lean sources of protein, um, you know, some good uh, raw carbohydrates, um, you know, good amounts of healthy fats, like olive oils, coconut oils, avocado, stuff like that. Um, and then obviously throwing in veggies in there. But let's say, again, someone wants to like lose a little bit of weight to get a little bit leaner, right? Now that might flip a little bit. I might prioritize uh, protein still, but maybe I'll, you know, cut down our uh, the total number of carbs uh, to lower the calories a little bit, um, cut down slightly on the total number of fats, again, to cut down on calories. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question about the, the, the 3,500, 4,000 calories, it is a little hard to say. Uh, it really depends on that person's size and activity level, but it, it doesn't seem that far-fetched. I have plenty of athletes that weigh like 160, 150 pounds um, that consume 3,500 calories, 4,000 calories in their you know, still having trouble gaining weight, even though they want to gain weight. So it's, it's pretty variable in that department. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Dave, how do I keep my muscles healthy, man? <laughs> yeah. So definitely, uh, bone rolling was the first thing that we saw that, you know, got all the rage and it was all exciting. And, uh, there's definitely value in it for sure. We still use it a lot. I think, um, foam rolling has been shown to 
People used to think it was breaking up scar tissue, which is kind of no longer supported by a lot of literature. It's more about blood flow. It's about, you know, desensitizing muscle and it's about getting some water to hydrate the muscle, which again, allows the muscle to be a little bit more, you know, pliable or movable. So I think foam rolling is a maintenance care and like getting a lacrosse ball on your shoulders and stuff like that is very, very important. But I think it's one piece of an overall puzzle, right? With the other ones being very specific stretching to know that we're stressing the muscle and getting tension through that muscle, right? The, the lats, the teres, the chest, things like that nature and sparing the ligaments or the joint capsules, which uh, unfortunately gymnastics, um, you know, old school 10 years ago, a lot of what we were doing that at the time, we just didn't know what we didn't know um, is putting a little bit more stress on the joint capsule than maybe the muscle that we want. So uh, moving towards some of the more specific stretches for like the lats and, and things that are very uh, targeted at the muscle is very, very important. But along with and it leads into this conversation perfectly is like eccentrics are a phenomenal way to help lengthen muscle right over time and try to get some of that stiffness to kind of come down. So using some eccentrics in a warm up or doing some like eccentric split squats when you first start off really do help to get some of that uh, flexibility uh, to be maintained. So, you know, there's kind of one half of the world, which is like muscles just relaxing and kind of like calming down and desensitizing. And there's another half of the world, which is like actually getting muscles longer stretching, foam rolling, manual therapy, you know, all that kind of stuff is, is more just the relaxing. It doesn't permanently change uh, proper strength conditioning, having good gymnastics basics and doing good strength conditioning with eccentrics actually does over time, hopefully stretch out the muscle itself. So uh, kind of two sides to that coin, but really to, to stay healthy is, is just the boring grunt work, man. You know, everyone on this call knows that there's a lot of a set of boring things you should do for quick soft tissue work, quick stretching, bands, warm up, cuff work, all that kind of stuff. That's not fun. It's not exciting. It's not Kovacs's, but it's, it's how you stay in maintenance. And Colin and I talked quite a bit about, like he said, you know, I have to do that boring 20 to 30 minute, you know, warm up and stretch in the morning when I'm stuck at home. And I have to do that boring 20 to 30 minute stretch and prehab routine for my shoulders and my ankles when I'm at the gym and every day, it's just part of my routine. And, you know, you find a few things that based on an assessment really work for you and you need to do, and you just put them into your, your daily grind. Dave and Duesh, I really appreciate your time and your willingness to uh, to share your information. Information is the thing that key, it links us all together, man. And uh, sharing that thing is an absolute blessing. So it's always a pleasure to you, Dave and Duesh. Um, I hope that you guys uh, continue to make a huge impact. And uh, we, um, we myself, I... I uh, I, I look to you to help us because um, I really have a huge amount of respect for the work that you guys are doing. So thank Good you. Good job. Thank you so thank much. Thank you.